I'm, uh, I'm very happy to uh, present some findings from uh, the special chapter on, on cryptocurrencies. Now, much has already been said about the impractical nature of cryptocurrencies as a means of payment and the scope for fraud and other illicit activities that they give rise to. But rather than going, uh, but rather than going over familiar ground, uh, in the special chapter, we wanted to dig deeper into the economics underlying cryptocurrencies, not so much uh, the details of the, of the technology. And the reason for doing so was to understand how well cryptocurrencies can perform the role of money and whether they could replace the conventional monetary system. Our assessment is that cryptocurrencies fall a long way short of being able to replace the conventional monetary system. And we focus on uh, two limitations. One is the lack of scalability, which is about providing flexibility and capacity to function as a payment system, regardless of the number of users. And the second problem uh, is ensuring the finality of payments, which is about a, a payment being irrevocable and unconditional. Finality is essential if we are to ensure that the buyer knows that he has the funds to make a payment. Let me give some context to uh, both of these points. The ecosystem in the workings of a blockchain-based cryptocurrency includes two key groups of participants. There are users who make and receive payments, and there are the so-called miners who serve as bookkeepers and who maintain the infrastructure of the system. The key innovation um, in cryptocurrencies is that uh, there are many bookkeepers and they all have identical copies of the ledger. So when a transaction is accepted by a bookkeeper, it is then broadcast to the whole network and all copies of the ledger are updated. Now this idea of keeping a history of all transactions connects with a classic theme in the theory of money. In fact, anthropologists have conjectured that in early human societies without money, goods were provided for the promise to return the favor in the future. And money can be seen as a record keeping device in this setting. So rather than everyone carrying around copies of a cumbersome ledger that records the whole history of transfers, money converts the tangle of IOUs into one simple token. In um, laboratory experiments with undergraduates as guinea pigs, uh, researchers find that um, the exchange of intrinsically worthless tokens does a better job at uh, generating cooperative behavior than when the, students are left to their, uh, when the students are left to their own devices to keep uh, track of who owes what to whom. Now the idea of everyone carrying around a shared paper-based ledger of all past transactions is clearly impractical. But the tantalizing question is whether computing and technology can come to the rescue and fulfill the vision of a shared ledger of all past transactions. It turns out, however, that the quest for decentralized consensus clashes with some key uh, features of the economics of money. And the issue is not one of technology. Uh, the issues have to do with economic incentives. So let's go back to uh, this diagram of the two key groups. Uh, we have the miners who act as the bookkeepers and the users who make and receive payments. The users need the miners to record their transactions in the ledger and the miners need the users because uh, the users make it worth their while to serve as the bookkeepers. In a system like Bitcoin, the miners compete by solving mathematical puzzles using computing power at, that, uh, at their disposal. 
The solution of the puzzle does not serve any useful purpose in itself other than to select a miner at random to scoop up uh, the pool of transactions waiting to be processed. Uh, it is just a randomization device and uh, a very costly one in terms of energy use. But the important point is that the miners are self-interested. So they're in it for the money. They serve as bookkeepers in order to receive their own reward. And the reward comes in two forms. On the one hand, they uh, receive a user fee paid by the users. And they also receive a block reward um, in the form of the, of the Bitcoin itself. But the block reward is due to be phased out over time. So in the long run, it's only the user fee that will sustain um, the payoffs to the miners. Well, why would the users want to pay a fee? And the reason is um, they want to get to the head of the queue because the miners can pick and choose which transactions to include into the block and then attach to the blockchain. So the more the user offers as a user fee, the more likely it is that that transaction uh, is included in the block. Now sometimes when there is congestion uh, in the use of, uh, of Bitcoin, the, the user fee can rise a lot. So this chart um, shows in red uh, the price of Bitcoin since the beginning of 2017. And in blue uh, is the average user fee per transaction. So the price is measured on the left-hand axis and the user fee is measured on the right-hand axis. And as you can see, uh, the user fees can sometimes get very high during peak periods. And at one point uh, last December, the user fee went above $50 per transaction. So uh, if you insisted on uh, buying a $2 coffee and insisted on paying it with Bitcoin, you would have had to pay in excess of $50 to have that transaction go through. Of course, now, uh, as the price has fallen, we see that the, the user fee has also come down. If, if we zero in uh, on that period, um, we can see that this kind of thing um, looks very much like a, an asset market. Um, in other words, people treat it as an asset. Uh, they pay to, to hold uh, these tokens rather than to use them as money. Uh, and in that sense, they, they're very much like collectibles, uh, like baseball cards, Beanie Babies, or Crypto Kitties. And the surge in user fees uh, at the end of December last year coincided with a crash uh, in the price of Bitcoin. And this kind of surge in transaction costs resembles what would happen in securities markets when market liquidity dries up during uh, sharp price changes. So one question worth pondering is whether cryptocurrencies should be treated as an asset rather than as money for the purpose of regulation. As you know, this is a hot button topic for discussion among securities regulators and other financial supervisors. Money has value because uh, it has users. So without users, money would be just a worthless token. And this is true whether it's a piece of paper with a face on it or whether it's a digital token. The tokens are intrinsically worthless, but I accept it as payment in the expectation that others will accept it. And the token is no one's promise in particular, but trust in money emerges as a property of the community as a whole. And the more others have trust in monetary exchange, the more willing I am to accept it. It's rather like a social media platform. If my friends are on a particular platform, I want to join too. So the motto is, the more, the merrier. In the terminology of game theory, money generates a coordination game. And this brings us to the question of scalability. In other words, do cryptocurrencies have the capacity and flexibility to serve as a well-functioning payment system? 
Now, with money, we have a virtuous circle where greater use attracts more users. And this virtuous circle is instrumental in, reinfor in reinforcing and entrenching um, the use of a particular version of money as a convention in society. But as we saw earlier, uh, the, uh, with the high user cost, um, sometimes we have congestion. And with congestion, rather than more the merrier, we have to turn the motto on its head. The motto should be instead, the more the sorrier. Now you might say, if capacity is the problem, why not simply increase capacity? So this seems like the, the obvious solution, but there's a catch. Because remember, there are miners that we have to pay. If there is too much capacity, then the miners are driven away because the users do not pay enough fees to, to keep the miners engaged. So in this sense, congestion is an essential feature of the system rather than a side effect. So think of a road like, uh, like these two here. If it's too narrow, the drivers stay away, fearing congestion. But if it's not used enough, there is no one to maintain the road because the, the miners are not there to maintain the road. And the road, and the road falls apart. So finding the right capacity is like balancing on a knife edge. Too small, and there is chronic congestion. But too large, there is no one to maintain the road, and it falls apart. And finding the right capacity um, is done at the launch of the cryptocurrency. So it is unlikely that the balance will have been struck exactly right at the outset. And perhaps for this reason, uh, there has been a proliferation of different cryptocurrencies. At the latest count, there were several thousand of them, and there are new ones springing up all the time. Let me now turn to the issue of finality. Uh, finality refers to the irrevocable and unconditional nature of the payment. And as you know, it's the cornerstone of a well-functioning payment system. And the conventional monetary system does this ultimately through the settlement on the central bank's balance sheet. Finality is especially important when one payment depends on another. So take this example uh, of producers arranged on a circle. And suppose that um, the good produced at one location is sold at the next location and the money uh, is flowing in the other direction. Now imagine that these are high value payments um, so that a producer needs the payment from the sale in order to pay for the purchase. Now as long as finality can be guaranteed, a buyer can always make the payment for the purchase conditional on receiving the funds from the sale. Now, there could be some possible delays in payment, but a buyer will never find himself in a situation where he has paid for something uh, when he has no money. But for cryptocurrencies, finality is an unresolved issue. This is because the underlying facts and history is formed as a matter of consensus, um, and it's a consensus among the miners, and the miners have their own individual incentives. In a decentralized setting, what counts as a valid payment is what the bookkeepers agree is valid. So a payment being recorded in the ledger is not necessarily the end of the matter because it may be erased and history rewritten afterwards. In fact, just as there's a game between the users, there is also a game between the miners. The miners act in their self-interest and sometimes they act in concert to further their own ends. As illustrated in this slide, this can happen, for instance, if um, a coalition of miners collude to hitch the latest block of transactions to a block that's further up the chain 
rather than to the end of the current chain. Now sometimes both branches can survive, giving rise to two different versions of the cryptocurrency. And this is called a hard fork. But sometimes one of the branches dies off and then all the transactions recorded in that branch would no longer be, be valid. Now it's true that being included in the latest block gives a high probability of finality, but it's never certain in the way that, conventional, that the conventional monetary system would ensure. And this is worth emphasizing, the risk of non-finality is very different from uh, the one in conventional payment systems, where finality may occur with a delay, but once it has occurred, it is certain. And in this sense, high probability of finality can never be a substitute for finality itself. As such, a payment that's conditional on another payment will always be subject to risk, no matter how small the probabilities are. So when there's a complex web of large payments in the economy, the lack of finality adds a new twist to the risk in the payment system. As exposures and payment histories that are interwoven throughout the system may be subject to unraveling. The principle behind blockchain is that miners are atomistic individuals who do not collude. But in practice, the highly concentrated nature of mining pools can make collusion by packs of miners a real possibility. And this is so especially for lesser known cryptocurrencies where the population of miners is small. In Bitcoin, uh, the miners are more numerous, but as you see from uh, this chart of the uh, proportion of computing power taken by the, uh, the mining pools, the mining pools themselves are highly concentrated. And the three largest mining pools account for more than 50% of the computing power. So let me conclude. Achieving trust and money through the consensus of self-interested bookkeepers presents difficult challenges. And as I hope I've shown you, the technology is only a small part of the issue of the viability of cryptocurrencies as a monetary system. It's the, it's the underlying economics which is the key. And I've talked about two issues. First, outsourcing trust to selfish bookkeepers results in a congestion game, not a coordination game. Money should be an institution with the motto, the more the merrier. Instead, we have the more the sorrier. And second, uh, outsourcing trust to selfish bookkeepers cannot guarantee finality, which is the cornerstone of the payment system. So I will conclude by repeating what uh, Augustine said in his presentation. The decentralized technology of cryptocurrencies, however sophisticated and useful for many other purposes, is a poor substitute for the solid institutional backing of money through independent and accountable central banks. <laughs>